Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again. It is 4 o'clock Eastern time on a Wednesday, and these days that can mean just about one thing if you're in the world of data. It's time once again for Hot Technologies. Yes, indeed, my name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your host for the show that's designed to figure out what's hot, what's happening out there, what's the cool stuff that's being used in the enterprise. And, of course, right at the foundation of everything we do in this whole field is the database. So we're going to talk about protecting your database. The exact topic is protect your database, high availability for high demand data. So there's a slide about yours truly and enough about me. Hit me up on Twitter at Eric underscore Kavanaugh. Of course, this year is hot. Data is hot. Big data is very hot, but it's really, it's still kind of on the edge. More of the cutting edge companies are leveraging big data these days. Most bread and butter organizations out there in the world are still using traditional data. And if your data is in high demand, then you want to make sure that it's available because when systems go down, when data is inaccessible, that's when you get unhappy clients, unhappy prospects, you get customer churn, you get unhappy all kinds of things, partners, et cetera. So you don't want that. And we're going to learn from some of the best today in the business. We're going to hear from our own Dr. Robin Bloor, a database expert of some three decades running, Des Blanchfield, who has been doing this for about as long, but he started when he was really young, and Bert Scalzo, from IDERA, who is really quite the database black belt. So don't hold back, folks. Ask questions. The big part of this event that is valuable to you is when you ask good questions and get good answers. So send them via the chat window or the Q&A component of your console. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Robin Bloor. Take it away. Okay. Um, let me click this and see if it moves. It does. Um, I'm not going to talk about database particularly. I thought that, you know, because I'm doing the intro, um, first introduction uh, presentation, I thought I'd talk around the aspect of service levels and, of course, um, availability, which is the deal, which is the topic of today's show. Um, and the question as to, you know, really what is availability? Um, and what part does it play in the way that people run data centers nowadays? One thing um, that I've noticed, I, I noticed this actually sometime in the 90s, I was working at one site and um, users started complaining because the email was down for 15 minutes. And it was interesting because the, um, the uh, uh, CTO or whoever's in charge of IT had actually, uh, one of the few places where in those days they'd actually determine the service levels and the email being down for 15 minutes wasn't in violation of anybody's service level. Um, it, I think it was allowed to be out for two hours in actual fact. It wasn't that email couldn't be used, it just that you couldn't send and receive it, the server was out. Um, and that kind of uh, um, alerted me to the fact that I've um, noticed um, moving forward since then that everything just speeds up and so does the expectation of the users. Uh, and this leads you to the situation where people might agree service levels, but often they'll start complaining when um, service levels aren't actually violated. So definition of service levels just to get to give a, well, it can depend exactly upon what you're talking about in terms of service levels, but we're talking about an IT um, system or an IT application. Um, normally defined in terms of performance, availability, and metrication. In other words, you can't really define a service level unless you can measure it. So normally there's some kind of um, measurement involved, uh, and it's normally a, a, about response times, particular transactions. Uh, and the availability of the system as a whole over a given particular period of time. And, you know, before about 1994, 95, it was really rare that any systems were required to be available for more than normal working hours. So, you know, let's say 8 in the morning till 6 in the evening to give it a, a, a normal span. And people built systems that way. And then, uh, and that meant that in one way or another, particularly with the database, um, you could um, configure the database in a particular way. And then as the batch window started to shrink, the need to think again started
started to arise with some systems and then other systems and then we got um the advent of service oriented architecture which started to make dependencies between systems that hadn't previously been dependent upon each other, making everything even worse. Um, and we, we got this squeeze in terms of uh, the availability of systems. Um, the a point worth making is when you're talking about availability, it includes backup and recovery and includes DR. You know, it, it's like it's not just availability in the normal times. So we're talking about, you know, there are um, a lot of different ways in which uh, a an application can fail. You know, you can get hardware failure, you can get the database failure, you can get software failure, um, uh, and there are loads of different species of those, of those things. And wh when that occurs, you need to be able to recover, and therefore you need to also back up the system. So there needs to be some scheme for backing up the system. Uh, and you also, in a lot of sites nowadays, you need a disaster recovery capability um, in case, you know, a whole building blows up. And something worth mentioning here, and I'm, I'm going to harp on about it in a minute, but business processes, they have service levels too. And in actual fact, it's the service levels of the business process that really matter to the business. Um, IT just has to do its part of it. Um, in, uh, you know, according to whatever agreement it had. So IT service levels are normally subsidiary to business process service levels, but just as it, it was really quite rare um, 15 years ago for any organization to have well-defined service levels, it's still quite rare for organizations to have well-defined service levels for business processes. That's something that's kind of happening now. It's not something that's been going on for a long time. This is the, the acceleration thing and time barriers, just worth mentioning time barriers. Um, we're gradually moving to an event processing world, and because of that, we're gradually moving to a real-time world, and because of that, we're gradually moving to uh, availability being required 24 by 7. And that's actually tough with a lot of systems. It's uh, difficult to achieve. Either it's very expensive, um, or in some instances, you might actually have to change the system, even move to a different database, a different version of the database software we're using. There's also these time barriers, and I always like to mention these whenever I get a chance. The, these are time barriers that um, applications run into. Applications might want to be as fast as possible. That's when software is speaking to software. There really isn't any acceptable latency in some situations. You want you want to be as fast as it can be. Uh, and those situations in the business terms like market situations where the person who comes with a buy order second gets a worse price and so on comes with a uh, who comes first, and, and therefore, you know, the software speed really matters. But, you know, below that, when you're actually dealing with, interacting with human beings, the, the best um, uh, response time that can really be demanded of you is one-tenth of a second, because that's about a human being's response time, and you don't need to go any faster than that, because a human being won't notice anyway. Between 0.1 and 4 seconds is a wait time, um, that human beings will normally tolerate, but as soon as you go past about four seconds, they're off doing something else, and therefore you're really into a batch activity. So you, you can see there's certain time frames and day, week, and month of those things where batch behavior makes sense, uh, and therefore you aren't in an event processing world, and therefore availability might be actually quite different in terms of what you need to be able to provide. But as soon as you're in the event world, then you're, you're into 24 by 7 um, availability. And technology ch uh, change is a factor in this. As the technology goes faster and faster, then the um, uh, availability demands increase. It just that's the way it is. This is um, layers of complexity. I don't want to go into this in any depth. It's just, you know, there are three things to consider here. There's the service level of infrastructure. This is the vertical axis, and then there's a service level of any given application, then there's a business service level, uh, and those are uh, dependent upon each other, 
uh, and they all need to in one way or another be taken into consideration if you're actually looking at creating the um, uh, a responsive environment where service levels are met basically uh, and then you have uh, um, down the bottom here which is I've just represented databases but you could do it with it, anything within the system you know you've got the non-stop configuration which means what it says it'll never stop you've got the hot standby situation where in one way or another there are different ways of achieving it but in one way or another if a database fails it's switched to a hot standby and there's very little lag in terms of time um, uh, to the point where users well, they probably would notice but they wouldn't notice much warm standby is more like the 20 minute switch over where everybody rings up the help desk and bitches at the help desk while the um, the database is being switched over to a standby and then there's a reboot situation where it, may, it can take very long periods of time and it's worth noting that any given application or any given database um, may be in any one of these situations um, depending upon what actually is going on and what the um, service level required of the application that sits above it actually is um, from that I uh, just wanted to make point about the complexity curve the complexity derives from nodes and connections the dependencies and in the world that we're living in the number of nodes and connections involved in anything just keeps on growing so you you're running into this kind of ex exponential curve <coughs> Um, and if you, if you kind of look at the way that complexity is increasing and the way that the time dimensions are shrinking then you know available, uh, for availability levels there are time targets and they're likely to be reducing and the natural evolution therefore is towards non-stop operation um, which is of course the most expensive at least in my experience the most expensive um, configurations you can create so in, in, in one way <coughs> uh, or another uh, any organization that's thinking about this really needs to think not just about what's happening now but what's going to happen in the future the net net um, uh, the, the, or perhaps the last point I want to make the management of service levels is an ongoing activity it doesn't you know it isn't something that you know you have a project and you do it and it's over it isn't um, because things just keep on changing so having said that I'll pass the ball to Des. Thank you Robin um, I love your opening slide it's um we just had the rerun of uh, I think it's Finding Nemo 2 the movie and so you had Nemo there searching for availability in the form of nines which I thought was pretty cute um, <laughs> always a tough act to follow so um, when I think about uptime and availability and high performance, the first image that comes to mind, because uh, uh, I grew up in the Solomon Islands near volcanoes on the equator, um, is a volcano erupting in my data center is this image I always have in my mind, but that's what could potentially happen if something goes bang. Um, and this is a picture of the lovely Mount Etna, which is like the northeast corner of Sicily, um, where it's next to uh, Katani, I think it is. Um, so, <clears throat> My approach today is to have a conversation with you and give you a couple of takeaways at the same level I do in a boardroom on a regular basis with from C-suite to the heads of lines of business um, with a view that we have a conversation about what can impact your organization from a commercial or a technical sense and the types of things that we need to be thinking about and, and how we sort of, you know, what we take away from that and how we go to then address some of the challenges that we're talking about when we talk about high availability and uptime, and particularly around database environments and platforms. So the question we pose initially is, you know, what do we actually mean when we talk about database systems and database platform availability? What does it actually mean to talk about the actual challenge of, of um, making something available to a, a level, uh, as Robin talked about, in the service level agreement style mapping of what do we actually need and want? Um, so the reality today is that and in fact, here are a couple of key realities in my mind. Um, today, everything is effectively database driven. You know, very few systems that are built today are built in such a way that stuff just gets stored in files uh, or, or is in some sort of flat file log. Uh, invariably, everything is database driven. And as a result of that, we have this need to start thinking about the availability of those databases 
for the different systems and applications and tools that depend on them and rely on them to deliver the services we, we're looking to deliver and sell or, or consume, um, and all the infrastructure around it. And in fact, so much so that when you think about the big disruptions that have come about of late, uh, and particularly the digital natives, as we call them, or the cloud natives, uh, some of the companies that have come along like Uber and Airbnb and, and so forth, uh, and, and the slightly uh, older uh, PayPal's and, and, and Ebay's of the world, uh, the scale and size of those organizations was only possible because of modern database technology and modern cloud infrastructure. Without that, without being able to provide availability, uh, they just simply wouldn't exist. You know, uh, imagine a scenario where you, you could only get to eBay between 9.05 and 9.25 because it was unavailable for the rest of the day because it was trying to do an archive or a backup or something like that. It just wouldn't have worked. So, um, yeah, and there's other key areas when you think about day-to-day uh, -day life. You know, we work retail and banking and finance and airlines and so forth. I mean, there's big industry groups like aviation and logistics and transport and shipping. There's government on, as a whole. There's national security and police and so forth. All of these industries, all these market segments, all these body groups, you know, depend on their environments being up and running. So with that in mind, we also have the other caveat that we've got to think about, the other takeaway that I want to leave you thinking about, and that is that our world is now what I call always on. We're permanently connected, and this is a, a, a theme you hear on a regular basis, and I'm going to repeat it and reiterate it. Um, you know, we now have smartphones on our hands all day, every day. We don't turn them off. We put them next to the bed. We invariably use them as alarm clocks. We use them as cameras. When we take photos, they push those photos uh, up into the cloud. You know, this is always on, permanently connected mentality. In fact, uh, there's a, a phrase coined which um, I like to use, and that is we're now sort of living the Fitbit generation, which is where we're measuring everything, we're monitoring everything that's being logged, and that's got to go somewhere. Um, and there's also another phrase I'm going to leave you with, and that is it's, it's 9 o'clock somewhere all the time. It's a 24-7, 365 world we live in. You know, the Earth constantly spins around the sun, and at some point in time, every hour of the day, it's 9 o'clock, and that means people are getting out of bed and trying to do stuff, buy things, sell things, et cetera. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about high availability? Well, it, it sounds really obvious until you start to dive into the detail. Um, so, you know, when we think about, okay, what does high availability mean? Well, the reality is there's no silver bullet. Um, it is quite a complex concept, you know. As Robin alluded to with, uh, with, with some of the topics he mentioned, such as uh, measuring availability and service level agreements, um, you know, we map it to things like, well, you know, I have these questions. Is it uptime? Do we worry about, you know, things like what we call five nines, which I'll go into in a minute? Um, do we concern ourselves with what's in our service level agreements? Um, for example, in service level agreements, I mean, SLAs, um, the three-letter acronym for service level agreements, have become more and more critical these days. Because we've gone through this whole process of on-premise and self-hosted to outsourced to third-party data centers and then outsourced managed services, and now we've gone all the way to the cloud. And um, the reality is that you know, when you talk about cloud, it's, it's really just other people's computers. Uh, and that means you're not running the infrastructure, you're not running the systems, and invariably you're not running the platform. So if you're doing infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, or even more importantly, software as a service. You know, imagine Salesforce, for example, you know, you don't touch any of that infrastructure, you just log into a web interface. <clears throat> so the, the only mechanism you have in that world of cloud and, and outsourced infrastructure of any form uh, to control that is service level agreements. That's the only mechanism you've got. And if people aren't meeting your isolation, then you, you know, they either uh, in due penalties and in, in, in a reduction amount of money you pay them, or you just don't pay them. Um, and so this brings back to mind this whole challenge of, you know, how do we how do we manage high availability, how do we manage availability uptime if it's not your infrastructure? Well, it's all around SLA, for example. Um, if it is some of your infrastructure, or even if it's someone else's infrastructure and as a design point of view, are we talking about load balancing um, to multiple sites? Is it a fault tolerance design pattern? Uh, do you run active-active or active standby in your architectures? Uh, do you have multiple servers, um, multiple storage platforms? Uh, how do those storage platforms operate? Do they replicate each other? Do they mirror each other? Um, are you running RAID? What type of RAID are you running for redundant uh, uh, storage? Are you running uh, RAID at the disk level? Are you running an object storage platform uh, that replicates across multiple uh, uh, drives and multiple systems and drives? Um, is it N plus one for every little piece of infrastructure you've got? Do you add another one? And is it in the same data center or another data center? Have you built a design pattern that uh, accounts for no single point of failure, for example? All these fundamental things, and they sound like simple concepts, but when you get into every, uh, each one of these things, they are very, very detailed things. When we talk about availability, we invariably end up talking about nines. And what do we mean with nines? Now, we've all heard about these, but let's just think about what they mean for a minute and why they're important. 
So we talk about one nine, which is just 90% availability. Now it sounds very high, but when we talk 24 by seven by 365, if we just look at one year, for example, when we talk at one nine, which is 90% uptime, um, that allows for 36 and a half days of downtime a year. So let's just round that to just over a month. Now think of any business uh, that we deal with every day, uh, whether it's our online banking or eBay or PayPal or social media platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter, or whether it's just a general retailer, or let's say I wanted to book a flight to come to the US uh, from sunny old Australia. Would I be happy if I want to come to America in a week's time if my favorite airline was down for 36 and a half days because the service provider said, hey, look, we're up 90% of the time. Of course I wouldn't. And as you go up this model, you know, 299% will it become 3.65 days, or roughly three and a half days downtime a year. Is that a big deal? Well, it is if you're running uh, Black Friday and you're running a sales special and people can only buy during those couple of days. Three nines becomes uh, as little as 8.7 hours a year, but even 8.7 hours a year, if it's a uh, consecutive uh, 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 nonstop eight hours of out time, well, that, you know, in banking and finance and in health, uh, you know, if it's a hospital, well, that, that could cost lives. And as you climb up, the you know, four nines is, is 52 minutes, five nines, five minutes, six nines is, basically 30 seconds. Six nines is extremely high, and as you go up this ladder, as you climb up this Christmas tree of nines, the more nines you've got, the harder it is to design the uh, environment and, and the platform, the harder it is to deliver that service, and you think about the, 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 the reduction amount of time you've got for things like backups to be run, administration, patching, maintenance windows for any form of outage, uh, all non-trivial challenges, and it all comes down to percentages of, of outage effectively. Um, and the key here that I like to convey is there is no silver bullet, as I mentioned before. Uh, when it comes to availability, there is no one size fits all. Uh, uh, you know, you may have a particular type of design pattern that suits key industries. I mean, the same challenges are faced by all banks, but some might be retail banks, some might be premium banks, some banks might be fo focusing on trading and investment and wealth management. Uh, some might just be purely consumer. Some might be internet facing only and not even have tellers and, and only deal with ATMs when they're dispensing cash. So in those scenarios, even in banking and wealth management and financial services industry as a whole, uh, for each of them, they, they still have their own particular flavor of thing they need when it comes to availability. Um, so you know, when you think about availability in plain English, um, you know, the mix between availability and high availability, uh, we think they are the same thing, but they're actually chalk and cheese. Availability is really just, a, and here I put it in plain English, a measure of time that a server or process functions normally or generally for day-to-day -day usage. That just means uh, how we describe whether it's available or not. Uh, and when we talk about availability, we often fall into this trap of thinking, oh, well, I'm providing it in an, in an available form versus high availability and protecting the security of that infrastructure. High availability, in other sense, in plain English, is a design where you implement or achieve some sort of outcome and availability of data in particular, where almost all the time, 24-7, 365 days a year, that availability gets to some of those nines. Uh, now, invariably, it doesn't mean 100%. 100% uh, is, is technically not possible in a real world in any one environment. It's very difficult to one server and an operating system and a database on it and a platform running on that and an application being delivered and expected to run 100%. So then we start thinking about designs. Do we have redundancy? Do we have multiple sites? Do we replicate? But in, when you put it in plain English, it's interesting just how different the, the, challenge, the topic of availability versus high availability becomes. Um, so I thought I'd put it in a really simple graphical form just to, to give us an idea of kind of what this looks like when you start climbing up the challenge of, of increasing availability and protecting your, your service uh, uptimes. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner here, we've got, you know, a single nine. So I've laid out the, the five nines that we generally talk about, six nines is a little bit outrageous. When we talk about five nines on the bottom left-hand corner, it's 35 days roughly about outage. And, you know, it's, it's a low-cost and low-complexity environment that you're trying to provide that because you've got you know, a number of things that can fail and you can still meet your service level agreements. But as you go along the bottom from left to right and you get to the point where there's more nines in the picture, you get these scenarios where you've got to think about replication of systems and platforms. Uh, you've got to think about clustering and virtualization of, of various parts of your infrastructure. You've got to think about um, uh, geolocation of those clusters, uh, multiple sites of data centers. And you've got to think about the type of industry and, and market segment you're aiming for. So what types of service levels do you need to meet? What service provision are you looking for? You know, is it a real-time cloud-based service? Is it um, telecommunications? Is it military services? Um, and so, you know, this graph sort of goes from bottom left to top right. Um, and as you get through that curve, uh, cost and complexity increase. 
um, as you get towards more uh, complex and more demanding environments, and, and ergo you need more nines. And this graph, for example, does a very similar thing. It describes the story between um, the cost component versus the, uh, the desired availability component. So on the top left-hand corner, we map uh, where we want highly available complex systems um, and uh, the, the cost incurred if that availability drops versus uh, the, the uh, benefit of having availability in zero downtime. So for example, if we, uh, we have an environment on the left-hand side where you know, if things are down, you know, we can incur losses that are financial, we can have legal implications, there can be commercial um, business and strategy level implications. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, potentially, you know, I guess even moral issues around having a service down if it's a, a health industry. And, and they start to go through, you know, the cost of an outage, uh, impact of the customers, uh, reduction of customer satisfaction, uh, as staff productivity, user productivity, et cetera. These things are impacted if, if we think about uh, designing highly complex, highly uh, dependent and, and highly risky environments uh, where there's potential risk for outage and therefore loss. On the right hand side, we try to aim for a scenario where, you know, um, if we, we invest high cost in planning and design, we invest in uh, intelligent implementation, we invest in providing people with skills and resources, and we have highly redundant networks and highly redundant operational environments and hardware and software, we get high availability, but it comes with a high cost. And so there's this, this sort of swinging magic pendulum spot of, of this optimal um, position in the middle where they cross over where uh, we've got slightly reduced costs and uh, increasing uh, uh, availability. But it's this juggle between the levels of nines and the, and the high availability versus continuous availability. And this is an ever-going challenge for us to meet as in how much money you're willing to invest to get the service level you're looking for. We also have the topic, which I won't go into detail, but I just want you to take this away and think about it. Um, the difference between mean time between failure in your design versus mean time to recover. In other words, um, are you investing in better quality infrastructure, better quality design, better quality hardware and software, and better quality uh, skilled staff and resources to, to engineer things and reduce the, the mean time between failure, the average time it takes for something to break, um, as opposed to lower investment in infrastructure and, and, and resources and, and design and design patterns, um, but higher capability to recover. In other words, if something breaks, you've got lots of it to plug in. Someone has a laptop that dies, you've got a spare one, you hand it to them in 30 seconds and they just log in. And these are very different ends of the pole. Uh, the, the top one infers that you're engineering with a high cost and high investment to avoid failure. And the bottom one says, well, I'm gonna accept that failure is gonna come, so I'm gonna engineer around that and be prepared for failure and to recover quickly. Um, and so as I mentioned before, you know, what I could say, my availability is not your availability. So when it comes to database environments and supporting the infrastructure around your database and protecting that and, and ensuring high availability, um, there is really no one-stop shop. Everyone has their own needs and wants. So you've got to ask yourself these fundamental questions that I'm going to leave you with. And that is that what can your organization afford? And I'm not just talking about dollar cents, but I'm talking about as an organization, what can you from, from resourcing and time and effort and so forth afford um, as far as the level of availability you can provide? Um, and also, what can your business support? So the current capabilities, the current skills, the current infrastructure, the current funding you can raise. Um, so that juggle between uh, what you can actually afford versus what you can support is an interesting balance. balance. And also, then you've got to ask yourself the questions, well, what skills and technology do you have in-house? Uh, I Can you outsource some of that challenge? Can you then, you know, if you move things to the cloud, uh, if you go for infrastructure service, platform service, software service, you, you worry less about that stack as you go further up the stack. So should you invest more in platforms as a service and not worry about the infrastructure piece? Or should you look at software as a service offerings because you don't have to worry about the platform? Um, what type of market and consumer or customer are you servicing? I mean, if you're a telco and someone wants to pick up the phone and get a dial tone all the time, that's a very different challenge to opening a small retail store from between Monday and Friday, nine to five, and, and closing down for an hour at lunchtime, um, like you know, a corner store barber. So you've got to think very long and hard how that works and what that means to your organization and what you need to be able to provide in that. And then the juggle between uh, what's on-premise, uh, what's externally hosted, um, and, and you know potentially what's in the cloud. And, and as I said before, that comes with its own challenge as well. And so we're left with that sort of you know final question that I before I hand over to our friends at Idea to to tell us how they address this, these very things. And that is that uh, there's this fine juggle between matching your desired and required availability and performance and what your business needs um, and what your market and your consumers need. And the reality is it's no mean feat. Uh, it is going to take time, effort, and money across the board to think about these things. Um, and invariably, it's investment in people and, and skills and capability and investment in software and tools 
to automate some of those processes and, and provide those people the right tools and the right systems to make their lives uh, not just better but possible um, because monitoring very large scale environments and protecting and managing those large scale environments is often beyond uh, individual human capabilities. So with that in mind, hopefully I've set the scene for a great conversation for our friends from Nigeria to talk about their platform and tools. Um, and I look forward to asking some great questions at the end. I'll pass on over. All right, Bert, I just gave you the keys. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Daz and Robin. Uh, I'm going to continue on with the topic of high availability for your data. And I'm actually going to leverage a lot of what Des just talked about. So the choices, the nines, the trade-offs, the affordability. I'm going to try and put that more in terms that a database administrator or someone closer to the, uh, the, the trenches would, how they would look at it, how they would architect it, and what those choices kind of mean. Now, I'm going to try to be database agnostic. I'm not going to draw, for example, uh, an Oracle-specific or a SQL Server-specific solution, but I'm going to draw, let's say, a generic architecture that all the database vendors offer something along those lines. They all call it different uh, by different names, but that's one type of choice that you have in common. And I want to look at that from both the business and technology perspective and how it relates to the business requirements. And I want to start from what the most basic pseudo high availability solution is through the options you have at storage level, virtualiz uh, storage level solutions, virtualization level solutions, at database level solutions. And then I kind of want to also introduce you to the fact that all of those choices are available in the cloud as well. So again, I'm going to try to stay fairly database agnostic. Now, uh, most of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, I know that they exist in Oracle SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres. There are also some third-party vendors uh, who make tools that also would uh, give you additional architectures that you could consider. And as Des just said, no one solution is the best. It all depends. But there is one universal fact in what we're going to be looking at is there's going to be more moving parts, so it's going to be more complex and therefore more costly. So we all know data is an important asset, and everybody knows that uh, fast access to the data is always nice, but reliable access to the data is critical. As he was talking about with his nines examples, you know, can you really afford to have 36 and a half days of downtime? It's critical that that data is available all the time. And so downtime can cost a fortune, both in terms of lost revenue, but even more important, in lost customers or in loss of customer goodwill. I'll give you a good example. If, uh, if a particular website where I make purchases is slow, I may try to find a new website who sells similar items at a similar cost who don't have slow websites. And so it's not just the loss of the customer, it's the goodwill that the customer has towards you. Now, hardware is a lot cheaper these days, so therefore there's more and more demand for high availability. And again, I'm going to uh, lead us to the cloud uh, when we look at that. And we have offerings from various levels, the storage vendors, the database vendors, the virtualization vendors, and now even the cloud vendors. And so what's really interesting with the cloud is, after I draw all these wonderful pictures of these architectures that you could build in the cloud, a lot of times it's just some check boxes you, you check and you say, I want uh, replication across geographic reason, regions, checkbox. I want uh, replication of key hardware components, checkbox. And so if you understand the pictures, sometimes in the cloud it's just checking a few boxes to build the picture that you've got in your mind. Now the key thing is what are the business requirements for high availability? For example, do I only have to worry about failure at a single site or do I have to have it across multiple sites? In other words, can I have one computing center and I don't care if that one center goes offline, uh, I'm not making a business requirement that, that it spans across multiple sites. It's a business question. And, and it's important to know how the business perceives the answers to that question because that typically defines your budget. Now, you also want to look down at the level of failure protection. 
Uh, could it be a power failure? Could it be a component failure, like a NIC or an HBA goes bad, a host bus adapter? Is it a hard disk that goes bad? Is it a storage cabinet failure? Is it a computer failure? Or in some cases, is it a site failure that's different than uh, – in some cases, you can have a site failure because the site itself is offline. In other cases, it can be that a substantial portion of the site is offline, but from your perspective, that's the whole site. And then as Des was talking about, what's the expectation of the time to resume operations? That's a business question. If the business says you've got to be able to resume operations within two minutes, then obviously that's going to define some of these pictures that I'm going to show you will work and some of them will not be options that you can choose. And another question that comes up during high availability, but often people forget to ask is, hey business, if something happens while I'm in the middle of processing a transaction, what am I allowed to lose upon resumption of the system? In other words, if I can bring the system back up in two minutes and I can lose no more than 10 seconds of, let's say, transactions that were in flight, is that acceptable business? And again, that will define what the business is willing to spend for that, and then again, that may define which pictures that I'm going to show you either apply or don't apply. So let's start with the most basic pseudo high availability solution. This is really not high availability, but I like to start with this because it, it gets people thinking the right way. If I've got a server and a storage array, typically I'll put multiple NICs network interface cards in that server and bond them so that if one NIC fails, I'm still up. And I'll do the same thing with my host bus, host bus adapters. I'll multipath, go through different switches so that I, I have multiple ways to get to my storage. And I've got a universal uh, power supply and um, I've got repetitive controllers inside my storage array, and maybe I've done something like RAID 10 with my disks. In other words, I've, in this picture, I've uh, prevented single co component failure at multiple levels. So I am not bound by the NIC or the HBA or the controller or the switch, but if you notice, the server's in red and the storage array is in red. I still have two areas where if they fail, if my server goes, I'm dead. If my storage array cabinet goes, I'm dead. So while this is not really high availability, it starts you to seeing and looking at the picture and saying, I want a picture where there's no red. And that's really the goal of this picture, is to get us pointed in the right direction. So the first thing that happens is, as a DBA, I, I might always want to put the um, high availability solution as a database implementation but it might be that it's available that it can be done as uh, a storage solution, or it might be that it could be a storage level replication. Um, in the case on the left, I've got storage virtualization. What's happening is I've got RAID 0 in two different storage cabinets for my disks, but I've got RAID 1 across the two different storage cabinets. In other words, I can actually now have a storage cabinet fail and, uh, and I'm not dead. So it's better than the prior picture, because in the prior picture, remember, we had uh, both red on the server and red on the storage array, and now we've made a, a small improvement. We now no longer have red at the storage level. We've used server uh, storage virtualization to solve that problem. Now, another way you could do it, and, and not all vendors provide this again, is that uh, you may be able to do storage level replication. So I'm not talking database replication, I'm actually talking about replicating your block I.O. for your storage. And that can be done at the storage level. And so again, now I have on the right hand side, another picture where I've removed the red from the bottom um, because I'm using storage replication. And so this is another picture that may or may not be available. And the person who would manage this may be your storage administrator rather than your database administrator. Uh, I like to bring this up because sometimes people think of, oh, high availability, it must be the DBA who addresses this problem. That's not always true. It could in this case be the storage administrator. Now, next, we can do server virtualization as a possible solution. Now, if you remember, uh, in the first picture, I had read at the server and read at the storage array. I could in this case, using virtualization, 
I might be able to relocate. And in some cases, that relocation is um, sort of a warm relocation. And in some cases, can actually even be a hot relocation. Some virtualization or hypervisors provide the capability to move a virtual machine in flight. And some databases uh, will accept that movement in flight um, readily. Now, not, again, not all hypervisors provide this, but this is one possible level of solution. Now I've made the top. The servers are no longer red, but I still have the shared storage array. And guess what? This solution may be a joint effort between the database administrator and the virtualization administrator, or it could even be just the virtualization administrator, depending on what level of relocation is supported on that hypervisor in that database. If you're wondering, wow, what does he mean by this relocation, give me a specific example. For example, in VMware, you may use vMotion to move your virtual machine from one host to another and do that without downtime. Now, clearly that prior picture had some red in it still. I still had the storage as being a single point of failure. And so we move up to the next solution, which is, well, let me combine the storage and the server virtualization. Now, in this case, again, it could be the storage administrator and the virtualization administrator who are building this solution. And now, look, I have a picture with no red in it. I've got high availability because I can relocate the uh, virtual machine or the, uh, the running application or database from one server to another. And I have virtualization in my storage array by having it doing RAID 1 across two separate storage arrays. I multi pathed on my switches and my HPAs. So now I've built an HA system, and I've done it primarily not at the database level. In other words, I've used other technologies to accomplish the same thing. So this is a solution. Then we get into what's called the shared storage scalable cluster. It's really not an HA solution, but again, I like to show it for the picture. And what happens here is we are, uh, we have two servers and running a database, and it's considered to be one database. It, it, it's not two separate databases. It's not like a master and a slave or a, a, a hot and a cold or, or a, uh, an active and a standby, this is both of those nodes work together to present one logical database. And so what happens is if a particular node fails, you're still up. So perfect, it, it protects you from server level failure and does that basically by uh, sort of sharding the node resources, if you will, but you still have a single point of failure at the bottom for the disk. And so this is a, a shared, storage, scalable cluster, and Oracle calls this real application cluster or REC. Now, another solution is to use a shared storage failover cluster. So on the left, I've got an active node. On the right, I've got a passive node. I've got a heartbeat in between. I've got a, st a shared storage array, and this is critical. You have to have that. And basically what happens is if the active node uh, encounters problems, the passive node can take over. Uh, there are licensing issues to this. Uh, some database vendors allow you to have the passive node op, uh, with, a, with a reduced license for a fixed time. In other cases, you have to have complete duplicate licensing. It all depends on your database vendor. But they all support this kind of picture, which is if one node goes down, the other node can take over. And typically, this is one of those scenarios where it's sort of uh, – when you go from the active node to the passive node, you are going to probably, in most databases, not all, you're going to lose some of the in-flight transactions. Now, then we get into what the database administrator really can look at, which is database replication. And there are two different ways of doing database replication. There's physical replication. And what's important is in the middle of this picture, you can see with the green star, that the replication, it's being done by the database, but much like the storage level virtualization, it's being done at the block level. So we're repeating the actual block IOs from the active node to the read-only or passive node. 
and this was considered to be physical replication. Now, let me go to the next slide because it's almost identical and it's logical replication. And the only thing that changes in the picture is that in the middle, instead of sending over the block I.O., we're essentially sending over the log files with the SQL commands in it. So in other words, what we're replicating is not the physical I.O., but the commands that cause the physical I.O. Uh, and so this is often called log shipping or log-based replication. Some database vendors give you this natively. Uh, other database vendors uh, may not offer this, but then third-party vendors offer it. And so this is a very popular HA solution, and, and it's considered a complete solution, but this solution is primarily the responsibility of the DBA. So I'm not using virtualization in order to accomplish this. I, I could but I'm not dependent on it. And I'm not using storage virtualization. Again, I could, but I'm not dependent on it. But I'm, I'm building a solution with the database being the primary driving feature. So this is logical replication. Now, it's also possible to combine database and storage virtualization. Uh, I could have at my data center, let's say on the left in blue, I could have virtualization for the storage so that I'm not bound to a particular storage array failing, but I may be doing database level uh, log-based or logical replication from one data center to the other so that the commands are executed in data center two resulting in I.O., but not necessarily the same I.O. because I'm not sending over the, the block I.O. either by the storage solution or by the database, but I'm shipping the logs and therefore the SQL commands. And so this is a picture that's uh, a very common picture for large organizations. And I like stop this picture here because I can actually, if I have to set this up on premise using a, a database like Oracle, I can do it. It's a fair amount of work. It's pretty complex. There's lots of moving parts. Um, if I do this in the cloud, I literally can just say checkbox. I want two geographic regions. I want the regions separated by, you know, on different continents. Um, I want storage level virtualization at a particular geographic region. I can even say that I want, uh, you know, the ability to do virtualization type allocation or, or high availability definition. And again, it's another checkbox. And the other thing I like about in the cloud, I, there's another checkbox often to say, eh, I don't want to deal with patching. Just patch it, you know, just work it into the into the workflow of everything else you do behind the scene. Keep me patched at, at all times. And so while some of these pictures are getting very complex and they might be very hard to do on premise, they're actually becoming quite easy to do in the cloud. Now the interesting thing is it's easy to check all the check boxes, but guess what? That costs more money on a monthly basis. Because if you're running two data centers and, you know, you've got two data centers out in the cloud that you're utilizing, you're going to pay more than if you were just using one. Likewise, if you're doing the storage level or the virtualization level rep, uh, high availability as an additional layer, again, there may be additional costs. So it is interesting that while it's hard to do on site and you may – overthink it. In the cloud, it's so easy to do, you may underthink it. So always know what the picture looks like and always know what the cost ramifications are for whatever picture that is that you're building. Now, there are lots more combinations than what I showed here. This is not a complete or exhaustive example. There's new technologies coming all um, at a regular interval. So who knows, I may not have shown one that's just come up in like the last three months. Uh, and high availability is a lot more common than it was 10 years ago. In fact, I would not consider it a stretch to say that for most large organizations, it, it's a mandatory business requirement these days. And I like to go back to this slide because I just said it's a mandatory business requirement. And I got these two tables on the right. The top one is out of the SQL Server documentation, and the bottom one is out of the Oracle documentation. And what these are, these are tables to help you pick well, which replication method should you use? And notice that you start with some very simple questions. How much data am I allowed to lose? And if the answer is zero, you know that you can only, in, in that top chart, pick the first or the fourth row. 
Then you ask another question. Well, how long am I allowed to take for the recovery? And if someone says, well, seconds or minutes, then that makes choices for you. And then does the failover have to be automatic or does it require someone manually to do it? Uh, and that's another business question. They may say that they want it automatic because they don't want to rely on, you know, uh, an escalation procedure and, and then somebody getting assigned a ticket and solving the problem. They just want it to be fixed. These are all business questions, and it's the same questions if I go down uh, and do the same for Oracle and ask, okay, uh, how, what kind of failure do I allow? What kind of duration? What can I lose? Uh, you know, what's the recovery procedure? These are all business choices. So if the business tells me the answers to three or four questions, my job's real easy. I just come in here, I pick whichever of these matches the closest, and then I build that. And remember, in the cloud, it may just be a few checkboxes to actually implement those. And with that, that brings me to the end of my material and the time to open this up for questions. All right, Des, maybe you first and then Robin. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, um, probably a little unfair for those not on Twitter, but I just tweeted a picture of a graph that I want to visualize everyone's mind. And then I wanted to throw the question to our, our uh, learned friend on the call here. When I think of proprietary versus open source in this space, which is often what we talk about, sort of proprietary databases from the likes of Oracle and, and, and uh, Microsoft and so forth versus open source, you end up with this challenge where in the proprietary world, the independent software vendor or software developer and the company invests in the bodies to build that complexity in. Uh, and so you end up with a scenario where you buy the software and you don't need to invest in many people because you're buying the capability built in and an open source. You don't pay for the software or it's low cost, let's say, but you don't pay for the software, but you've got to invest in the bodies. And I'm keen to get your thoughts on the, the juggle, particularly now that we're moving into cloud models where you can get either or, you know, you can, you can go to AWS or Azure or anyone, Rackspace or wherever, and, and buy, a, you know, a, a, as a service that the proprietary database platform, or you can build your open source world. And what we just talked about, what's the juggle between sort of proprietary and open source and how the design patterns you're talking about take effect? And, and what are your general thoughts around this topic uh, as we're moving forward, um, particularly around providing availability? One of the large items that I run into when, I, when I'm trying to address that question, I'll go back to the customer and ask them about their performance requirements. And the reason I do that is I have found, at least historically and in my own experience, uh, that when it comes to customers who need high throughput on their replication, I'm almost always better off with the, the replication that's provided by the database vendor due to the nature that it, it, it's more inherently built in and it's at a lower level uh, and sometimes it uses mechanisms that are not available uh, to the outside world, even, even in an open source solution. Um, and, and I'll give you a good example of uh, one case I had. I had a... Um, an internet-based uh, internet company who was using MySQL as their database, and they were on an old version of MySQL, and uh, like version four. And the replication between their nodes was the limiting factor on how large they could scale their databases. And they were looking at uh, buying a third-party solution, then they were looking at, well, maybe we can use one of the open source solutions. And what it really boiled down to was all they had to do was upgrade their MySQL to version, I think it was 5.5 we went to, because the difference between those two database versions was in the 4 version of MySQL, uh, replication was not threaded, and in version 5 it was. And that was actually the best path for them. Now, we looked at the other choices, but the deciding factor was performance and staying with the database vendor solution and doing the database upgrade actually ended up being our best solution to get uh, the highest probability of getting the performance they needed uh, to go along with the high availability. Yeah, it's, yeah I, that mirrors my own thinking, to be honest. Uh, just a, for full disclosure, um, uh, I won't go into brands, but I, you know, I've come from a, a proprietary background working for OEMs and software vendors and ISVs in general, and, and that's definitely been my experience. And at the same time, I'm very pro open source and I'm a code committed to a bunch of projects we won't name, but um, 
Yeah, I agree with you in that is that you know if you're if you're a large organization, let's say you're a bank or whatever you might be, the invariably you don't want to be an IT shop. You know, like for example, if you're a, a newspaper publisher or if you're a retailer, you don't want to be a an IT shop that publishes newspapers. You want to be a newspaper shop that actually just leverages IT. And so investing in the proprietary capabilities where the software developers build all that capability for load balancing and so forth in the, the tool makes a hell of a lot more sense uh, versus if you're like a dot-com startup or something like that that they can invest in human bodies. Um, uh, where do you see where do you see this going? My, probably my last question before I hand it off to Blog because I know we're running short of time. Where do you see this going from a, a, a trend point of view? So you're out there all the time. You're on the bleeding edge of this stuff. Are you seeing people have sat up and paid attention and woken up to the need to make this a commercial part of their day-to-day -day conversation or like to the boardroom? Or are you still seeing it being very much the geek farm of the techies and the hoodies thinking about availability because it, it makes them wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning when something goes off line? Do you think the trend is swinging now to organizations of every size, not the obvious ones like airlines and, and banking and finance, but just businesses in general? Do you think people have really got now the value proposition of protecting the database environments and providing high availability and investing in that? Or do you think we've still got a way to go? Well, what's your general sense in the market out there? Right now, I think there is still a gap, but it's not a gap because the business isn't asking for it. It's a gap in the communication levels between the two sides of the fence. In other words, the business people are very clearly saying, um, these applications require high availability and have these specific requirements when we say high availability. And somehow or other, that message is not getting uh, clearly across to the tech people, or the tech people will come back and say, oh, well, that's complicated, and it'll cost you more money, and this, that, or the other. I think what's going to happen is that's going to erode away finally, because honestly, with it being – for example, in the cloud, just checking a few boxes here or there to say, build me this really complex technology structure, there's really no good reason for the technology people to come back and say to the business people, oh, it's expensive or it's hard to do or this or that. And the business people are starting to, to know that that's the fact. Uh, and I've even yeah. seen in environments where, you know, um, their own IT people will come and say, oh, you can't have what you want. It's too expensive. And they'll bring in a third-party consulting firm who will then say, uh, no, that's not correct. Here's how you could do it. Here's what it will cost you. And, um, and then, they, you know, so I think we've got a, still a little bit of time be, between the communication levels between the two sides before that becomes automatic still. Yeah, and that, uh, that's definitely mirrored what I've seen here in Australia and around Asia Pacific. I'm sure it's a global thing, and that is that uh, a lot of the key decision makers from the border and down, all the heads of line of business, they're a lot more technically savvy. They're, they're reading the blogs. They're watching webinars. They're tuning into various articles and podcasts, and they're going to events and forums and meetups, and they now know their options, and they know cloud is an option. They also know that they can bring that, as you said, that capability in-house. And so I think there's this interesting challenge now that the conversation has got to take place, which is basically what we've done today, where people kind of start doing things internally, you know, just run brown bag lunches and have an internal briefing on what's our current state, what's our ideal state, where do we need to get to and then sort of get that together. I had a private message, which I'm just going to quickly touch on just now. Someone asked the question, you know, is it realistic that you can get 100% availability? Um, and you might be able to correct me here, but um, uh, I'm going to say yes. I, I've built a, a platform for an electronic funds transfer, uh, FPOS uh, gateway between uh, SWIFT banking platforms and the FPOS terminals. Uh, I built this in the early 2000s. It's actually been online 100% of the time for 17 years. In fact, it was built prior to 2000s, but it went production in like 2000, 2001, roughly. So the 17 years has been in place from development to testing and then going to production. And in that 17 years, um, very low-cost commodity off-the-shelf PCs running an open-source operating system for a proprietary database have been doing uh, active passive swapping every 90 days with different design patterns being applied with replication of disks in each server, replication of data between multiple servers, replication of multiple data centers, and flipping from data center A being production for 90 days and then flipping to data center B and being production. And as it flips, it automatically patches and updates. So just to the, uh, to the question I just got privately, yes, it's possible. Um, there was a lot of investment in that project in a design point of view. So the infrastructure was actually not that expensive, but the design and the testing and the implementation was very expensive to get that. So we didn't have to spend a lot of money in the hardware and the infrastructure, but we used very smart tools 
back in a day when cloud wasn't even a coinage. Um, so the answer is yes, it can be done. Even more so now with cloud, uh, as we just heard that, you know, with a click of a button, you can enable that capability. I'm going to throw it to Robin because I'm sure he's got questions as well. But thank you very much for answering my questions and, and really loved hearing your, uh, your message today. Um, completely uh, on board with all that because it mirrors everything I've been doing for the last nearly 30 years myself. Well, okay, I shall pick it up. Um, well, one of the things that fascinated me about your presentation was the number of options that are available now that weren't available when I used to have to struggle with this stuff. And I'm kind of interested in who's going to design these configurations, or who nowadays designs these configurations. What used to happen, you know, or the world that I'm used to is that there would be a fairly heavy transactional system and you would be interested in high uptime, um, high availability because, you know, the transactional system, uh, it would be expensive if it, if it went down in any way. Um, and you would, in one way or another, you wouldn't have all the options that you've just presented to me, but in one way or another you could find a way via replication mostly um, to to create a hot standby that wouldn't it, it wouldn't um click in unnoticeably but it could it would give you a degraded service until until you got back and i'm kind of looking at, uh, at what you were showing me and thinking about it not having done any of that kind of design work for 15 years um it, who's doing that work now i mean is, is this the um uh is this uh, as it was in my day, something that you you did at the onset of a project to get you know get the infrastructure right, um, or is this something that um, is an ongoing activity within an organisation? Because there's an awful lot, you know, there's new technology choices that come along. In the large companies, who are very efficient and effective at all of their operations, including their IT they typically will have a centralized architecture group or they'll have some name for it. Um, I've heard it called the architecture group a lot of times. And it will be their responsibility to know all these different pictures and what the pros and cons are and what the costs are. And what will happen is when a particular application uh, is looking and says, hey, I have to meet business requirements X, Y, and Z, hey, architecture team, what are my choices? They will give them uh, the answer, like here's the two or three that are available. And then at that point, then it becomes, uh, it move, the decision moves back down to the lower level, to the application team or to the business sponsor of the application. But typically, there's a centralized group who are staying on top of this and having that information uh, at the ready and pre-built. Now, in some medium-sized companies where it's not that formal, what will tend to happen is you will get uh, one or two of your senior DBAs or system administrators, and they will informally be, quote, the domain expert for that kind of expertise. Uh, so even in the, in the medium-sized companies, it happens. It just happens in a non-formalized structure. Okay, I mean that's really kind of interesting. Um, and in my day, we would never be thinking of high availability except for the transactional systems. Well, nowadays, of course, you've got streaming systems that are subject probably to even even greater um, demands in terms of availability. But do you, in in the query base, backend analytics, data warehouse? BI kind of um, environment. Do you ever see requirements for high availability there? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that question. I did some work for a retail firm, and their decisions uh, for strategic, the, the strategic decisions for the business were based in a large part off of the uh, analysis they would do from the data warehouse. And in fact, they were interviewed by uh, Forbes magazine, and the executive, the CEO of the company said, hey, you know, our stock price uh, grew 250% over the last five years, and a very large reason that's true is because we know how to effectively leverage our data in our data warehouse. They were so good at making business decisions that for them, 
the data warehouse, being able to do those analytics, being able to make decisions on a daily basis against their operational data was actually to them a production system. And I'll give you a good example of how important it is. If this particular retail vendor, the guy who was responsible for beer sales, he was like the third most important executive in the company because he brought in, you know, 60, 70% of the revenue. And so he had to be able to, in order to stay competitive in that market, he had to be able to know every day, you know, what promotion should I be running? Uh, you know, and that could be based on, you know, not just time of the year, but weather patterns and, and other critical data that can affect sale of something like beer. Well, I guess there's bound to be things like that. I, I, I think I should, because we're kind of out of time, I think I should hand it on to Eric in case we've got some questions from the audience. Eric? Yeah, this has all been great stuff, Bert. Um, we, I think you addressed all the questions that we had from the audience in your presentation, but uh, it is fun to watch. And I'm glad that you kind of talked about storage virtualization and, and how an impact, um, how much of an impact that can be. So this is all good stuff. Well, folks, we do archive all these webcasts for later viewing. So hop online to techopedia.com to look for the webcast section. All those uh, hot texts will be listed there. Big thanks to our friend Bert for his expertise, and, of course, to Des and Robin. And with that, we're going to bid you farewell, folks. Take care. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.